this is Savan from Humanity uh, Foundation, and today we're talking to Dr. Shruti Kapoor from Safety. Dear Shruti, tell us a little bit about you. During your own personal journey, you decided to stop complaining about things and take some concrete steps to fight violence against women. Safety is my organization that I founded in 2013, right after the horrific gang rape that happened in India. I grew up in India. I spent the first 20 years of my life in India. And like most young women and girls in India, I was sexually harassed both on the streets and at home. And it was something that I, you know, I was repeatedly told to ignore. And I did not have the courage to raise my voice against these harassments and any forms of violence that were happening in India. It was not later till I moved to the U.S., for higher education that I really truly understood what the meaning of women's safety is and what the meaning of freedom is to be able to walk freely on the streets without having to worry about your personal safety or without having to worry about somebody inappropriately touching you in a crowded bus or in a public transportation. Unfortunately, when the horrific case happened in 2012 in India, it was like for most people, a breaking point for me to where where I really actively wanted to do something about young girls and women's safety. I no longer wanted to be a silent bystander. And, and that's when I decided to, you know, start safety and actively start working in the space of women and girls safety. The whole premise of safety is to provide education and empowerment against all forms of violence to women and girls. And what that really entails is uh, our educational component is through online campaigns, through uh, discussions, through online chats, uh, wherein we provide the information on what your rights are as a woman and girl, how you can better protect yourself if you've ever been harassed or an, a violence uh, against, you know, a, a crime has happened against you, how you should report it, how you should speak up against it. So those are our educational components. The goal is to provide a safe space Mm -hmm. for people to talk about violence against women, talk about the taboo topics that are related to violence against women, Mm -hmm. and then work as a community to find solutions on how we can make our community safer. It's a crowdsourced initiative. It's a a crowdsourced initiative because the problem is, you know, it it needs to be a crowdsourced solution too, right? The problem affects everybody. The problem is not just a problem for women and girls. It's a problem for the community. And therefore, we feel the community needs to come together to find solutions to the problem, to make their city safer, to make their community safer. Um, And the the final uh, piece of our work is the empowerment bit which we do through self-defense workshops. We are big believers. I personally am a big believer in preventive measures, and I believe that every woman and girl should be able to take care of her own personal safety, should know some basic self-defense skills, which keeps her more alert and empowered against violence. So offline and online. Excellent. Offline and online, that's right. So if you could share the top three practical learning points that you took away from all these conversations online, that campaigning and and information acquired through safety, what would they be? I think the top three things that I have come to realize over the past three, four years now is one, that violence against women is really a global problem. It's not a problem that is very specific to India or to the U.S., Every single country and community is going through this problem. Mm -hmm. And so what is really needed is shift in attitude and mindset of the people to not think of this as a problem of women only, but to think of this as our problem and to work on it together to come up with a solution. So engaging the community is very, very important because we as an institute, as an organization can only do so much. The government can only do so much unless we all work together, the solution to such a pandemic problem is not possible. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. The second thing is that a lot of women and girls grow up in a patriarchal setting wherein they are always told to keep the voice low, wherein they're always told to obey. So these gender stereotypes that we grow up with, I think it is important for us to break away from those gender stereotypes and patriarchal rules and norms which which we tend to normalize because that's what 
we've seen all our lives. So one big request of uh, mine is to parents and families is to raise your kids from a very early age to treat each other with respect. You know, don't don't compartmentalize them into gender um, silos, into gender stereotypes, mm-hmm. and tell them that boys shouldn't cry or that girls are the weaker sex, they need protection. Teach your children that they are strong, they are powerful, and they should respect each other. Mm-hmm. Because that's what, if you grow up with that kind of an attitude, uh, I think this problem of violence against women can easily be addressed. And uh, the third thing is that, you know, be a better bystander. You know, it's very easy to sit on the fence. It's very easy to sit back and point fingers at, oh, the government is not doing their job or the police is not doing a good job. But uh, look at yourself and ask yourself when you hear of a story of a victim, do you become judgmental right away? You know, the, what is the first question that comes to your mind? What was she wearing? What time of the day was she out in? So I think we all need to reprogram ourselves and learn how to become better bystanders and speak up against all forms of violence. So when we see something, say something. From all that activity and, uh, for instance, all the, the stories that are shared and the snappy stories on, on your Twitter, on the Twitter chats and the longer stories elsewhere, you know, for survivors of all kinds of abuse, sharing a story or reading other people's story can have an invaluable positive impact to break isolation and sometimes find relevant support. What other right. stories of impact or positive outcomes have you come across during your journey with safety? So, like you mentioned, the survivor stories are extremely inspirational, um, you know, because uh, they have shown us that people are not alone in this journey. Like, you know, when when a survivor or when a victim of rape shares her story and the community comes together in support, she realizes that she's not the only one who's gone through this. And some other stories, positive stories, I'll give you an example from a self-defense workshop When we started off with the self-defense workshops, I personally had worked with a group of 25 young women from a very remote part of India. And we had done a two-day workshop, self-defense intensive workshop, wherein, you know, these women had started off very skeptically as to what this whole workshop is about. And we uh, had initially told them that, you know, during the workshop, you learn how to break a brick with your hand. And at the end of these 48 hours, you should feel more empowered and confident. And one of the success stories was really, you know, this self-belief that we are strong and we are powerful. So during the workshop, each one of us actually broke a brick with our bare hands. Mm-hmm. And if you ask me today, can I do it? My instant answer would be, oh, no, you know, I'm never going to be able to do it. But in that moment, with that belief that we can do it, we actually did it. And so we shared stories of, you know, we did role plays on gender um, disproportionate, gender inequality in our houses. So that that the stories that came out from those kind of workshops where people feel safe, in, in that setting to open up to you, to share their personal stories, to come out more empowered with the understanding of personal safety mm-hmm. and the belief that, yes, I can do something about my safety is very, is very, very positive and encouraging. And I see this happening every single time we do a self-defense workshop where, you know, initially the students are skeptic, but at the end of the workshop, they feel like, yes, I can protect myself. I can do something. And even if that something is, you know, kind of running away and or screaming for help or just being alert and aware, you know, mm-hmm. um, I think that that is a very positive impact. So bringing network, bringing people together, changing limited beliefs and making people see and feel that they can actually have control is something crucial, isn't it? Yes. You've been a part of our safety chats, which are these online Twitter chats that we do weekly. And over the past two years now, this chat has become our go-to place for a lot of people around the world to come and share Uh, very, very personal stories about topics which are usually a taboo in their country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, very personal stories about menstruation, personal stories about marital rape, stories about child sexual abuse. 
people are you know sharing these stories and learning from each other and that is another positive outcome that i have seen over the past two years uh, again the power of crowdsourcing of social media and bringing communities together mm-hmm. for a common cause fantastic so tell me what initiatives around the world which are harnessing ICT, Information and Communication Technology, for the acronym lovers. Um, yeah. uh, so the initiatives that are harnessed ICT to prevent violence against women. And so which one do you find particularly interesting? Um, another thing that is uh, that is becoming common is now to use crowdsource maps to point out cases where crimes have happened in your city. So you can map, let's say you're harassed on a particular intersection of your um, street. You can uh, go back and put on the map that this is exactly the place where I was harassed, where I was catcalled. And uh, crowdsourcing such information is now, you know, bringing this information on a map where people can see what are safe zones and unsafe zones. So I know now that in this particular neighborhood of Delhi, um, there are there are a group of people standing and catcalling women. You know, it's unsafe for me. So using that kind of information and technology to again point out to safe and unsafe cities and zones in your neighborhood in your city, I think is an excellent example. So what would you suggest for it to to make this place safer? Uh, rather, rather that. So I, I appreciate the the examples of. Um, mapping uh, where the occurrence of violence have taken place. But if you talk about yeah. prevention, what would you suggest we we did maybe using technology or without technology to make these places safer? I think it all, again, comes back to the community. So the, the police and the system can only do so much unless the, poli- uh, the community itself is engaged and involved in providing these solutions. It's going to be a tough battle. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if I know that my the corner of, you know, my neighborhood, particular corner of my neighborhood is unsafe for everybody because there, there are these group of boys standing and catcalling young girls and women, then I, as a community should come up with a solution on, you know, addressing it. So maybe you form a committee or form, a, you know, a group of people from the community can address those boys and uh, tell them that what they're doing is wrong. And Or if I know that there's a dark alley in my neighborhood which is missing a street light, then maybe, you know, go talk to the municipal uh, corporation in your in your neighborhood and ensure that the street is well lit because, you know, one of the biggest... Uh, unsafe zones are when there's no street light for uh, for anybody to walk on you know mm. so small things or if, if there's a public restroom which is there in your neighborhood but it's you know it's unusable and that makes it unsafe for women and girls then make your position holders you know whether they are members of in, in our case you know in India it's members of parliament and the congress people make them accountable, right, uh, for the safety and security of your community, of your neighborhood. So you, uh, as a community, should make people in power accountable for what is not working right in your community when it comes to safety and security of women and girls and for people in general. It's not just about women and girls. If public transportation is unsafe, and this is the bus that I have to use every single day, uh, I should not just sit quiet and endure it. I should... I should find out who is the right group of people I should reach out to, who is responsible for public transportation in my city, and, and, you know, knock some doors, make some noise. Bringing all this evidence together, maybe using technology to take videos wherever it's suitable, pictures, recordings. It's so easy to, you know, use your phone, take a picture, snap a picture of a street light, of a street that is very poorly lit. It has no street light. Mm -hmm. Or take a picture of the bus that you're traveling in, which is super crowded with people. Mm -hmm. And thanks to social media, you can mobilize people. You can reach out to authorities easily. You can actually make a noise about things that are not working yeah. right in your community at a fairly reduced price as well so is, is, oh, that, absolutely. is this how yeah. we because i know you you hold a phd in economics you've consulting for the world bank you've uh, you've you've served as a as a professor of economics in la so i mean the business case is not is is something that you're familiar with how can you bring yeah. the business case for a world free of violence that's the one million dollar question it's, yeah, it is. And the answer is not, uh, it's, there's no one solution to this problem. I think what I really, really, again, want to reiterate is, let's go back to the household level. Yeah. Um, 
let's tell our parents, let's make, you know, gender sensitize the parents. Let's tell them that it is their responsibility. It all starts at home, right? When, when a child is born, the, the education that you provide to your children is what they, and the culture that you raise them in is what they then grow up and learn, right? Yeah. So teach them very, very early on. Teach your boys to respect women and girls and vice versa, right? Yeah. Don't give the message that boys are more important than girls or that a girl's role or place is only in the house taking care of her husband, her brother. You know, those are all the wrong kind of messages with which if girls grew up with, they grew up thinking that they are inferior, that they need protection, that they need to be taken care of. These are all the wrong messages we're giving out. So, you know, start at home. Start with what you have, with wherever you are. Educate yourself, empower yourself, and then teach your children the same information. Provide them with the right tools and knowledge so that when they go out into the society, they know how to raise a voice against what is wrong. They know how to respect women. When they see somebody harassing a woman, they know when to speak up and what to do next. Okay. So really start with the household. That's where it all starts. It's not just, oh, I'm an individual household. What difference can I make? If each household makes a difference in their own household, yeah. it, you know, the community is better, the neighborhood is better, the city is better, and eventually the country is better, right? Okay. Shruti, thank you very much for answering oh, thank our, you our so questions. Much.